in traditional herbal medicine, um, which is the use of herbs in a clinical setting, in the West, what we have done and what has been handed down to us is an understanding of herbs in the context of their, their physiological effects, their, um, their actions. Not so much what herb is specific for what condition or what herb is specific for what process, but what actions, what qualities of the plants are going to be um, most physiologically effective. This has this has real implications for the clinician, for the diagnostician. Um, it means interpreting the person's disease state, um, the person's health, their, their, their general picture in terms of what processes are balanced, what are healthy, what are dysfunctional, and look at how herbally we can address the individual's needs. The needs that we identify are partly going to be coming from an interpretation of the pathology of uh, the presenting condition, but then we can take into account many, many more things. Um, the person's personal history, their family history, their um, their non-pathological experience of their life. So you can treat people as a whole rather than just treating their disease, which is a real strength. It's a real positive contribution to healthcare that I think uh, the mainstream are really missing because they're seeing herbs as sources of, um, of natural pharma pharmaceuticals which are just going to work on specific issues and and you can do that but you miss the point of of western herbalism and chinese herbalism and ayurvedic herbalism though their language is different so the best way to approach an understanding of the materia medica so that it's usable is getting a handle on what the range of actions are that each herb possesses um, this can initially be a bit intimidating and confusing for, for the student because it seems like the herbs can do too much. Chamomile, for example, is um, anti-inflammatory, mild muscle relaxant, mild relaxing nervine, etc., 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 mild bitter. Um, now, that can be confusing if you see the plants as sources of a specific active ingredient. If you see chamomile as a source of apigenin, one of the flavonoids in it, um, how can apigenin have all those different activities? But it's not apigenin, it's the whole plant effect. And, and as we said before, the whole plant contains many, many, many uncountably different constituents. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the herbs can do more than one thing. So let's start talking about the actions. And um, we're sitting next to comfrey, um, one of the most important herbs in Northwest European materia medicas, um, which unfortunately has become very political. But let's just leave all of that stuff behind at the moment and think about the actions of comfrey. It has multiple actions, but two really dominant ones. Um, dominant in that um, these are going to be the main experience of the patient, but they're, they're modified by the secondary actions. The dominant action is one called demulcency. Um, it's, it's one of our best demulcent herbs, meaning that it's rich in um, mucopolysaccharide, which is a form of carbohydrate which swells in water and um, produces a, a useful barrier between irritants and sensitive tissue, such as in the mouth or often in the stomach. It, uh, you can use demulcents to stop stomach acid irritating inflamed linings. Um, there are lots of medicine making issues around how to best get the demulcency out, but with comfrey, um, marshmallow, slippery elm, and then to a lesser extent, plantain, and many, many more herbs from there on. You have herbs which can apparently stop the pain of inflammatory conditions. They're not really stopping the pain. What they're doing is producing a safe temporary barrier between 
the sensitized tissue that would experience the pain and some body fluid um, that at that point in time is irritating the inflammation. So um, if someone has got a um, stomach ulcer and they, they drink a couple of hits of whiskey, they're going to get pain. You can use uh, comfrey root, marshmallow root to stop that pain, but it's not stopping the pain. It's not stopping the inflammation. It's just getting in the way of the alcohol burning the lining more. So you can get very rapid results, purely symptomatic. You're not reversing any, any illness patterns, but symptomatically can relieve a lot of discomfort. Um, using plant constituents which the body eventually metabolizes into sugar, so they, it's food, totally safe. Um, there is one very minor therapeutic concern um, that is probably more theoretical than actual. If you use demulcents and take prescription medications at the same time, it's feasible that the demulcency slows down the assimilation of, of the drug. So you just do them at different times. Um, when demulcents are used topically, they, they're usually called emollients. Not all emollients are demulcents, but all demulcents can be emollients. Now, one of the wonderful benefits of comfrey is that it has another primary action as well. And this is the action of a vulnerary, which is one of those old medical terms that you only find used in herbalism anymore. But it, it describes something that promotes the healing process, the physical healing process. Um, more technically, it pr promotes granulation. So if you have um, a wound on the skin, or if you have a stomach ulcer type wound, ul ulceration erosion, um, vulneraries can promote the healing of those wounds. They can be very effective. This makes comfrey almost specific for stomach ulcers because you, you can, with the demulcent component, um, stop the irritation, reduce the symptomatic discomfort, make life less physically stressful for the patient. And at the same time, because of a constituent in comfrey called allantoin, which is actually used in the pharmacopoeia as a wound healer, um, the allantoin promotes the healing of um, the damaged lining of the gut. As long as the person isn't carrying on drinking or eating or smoking things which are actually the cause of the ulceration, if they change their diet and lessen stress in the process, comfrey will very rapidly initiate the healing process in ulcers. Um, I, I know of nothing that comes close to it. And yes, I know we should be talking about H. pylori and all of that stuff. If we look at this from a traditional perspective where nobody knew about H. pylori, comfrey works. If the ulcer comes back um, after a while, then, then you need to really think about is it caused by H. pylori, which then will lead us to golden seal. And we'll talk about that when, when we get to that action. Um, one of the big problems with the mainstream statements about the dangers of comfrey is that um, in the process practitioners are just taking that on board without really questioning the statistics, the science, the toxicology, um, and not using comfrey internally. So in the process losing one of the best herbs for one of the commonest conditions our, our culture experiences, which is really unfortunate. Comfrey has some other properties as well. It's a, a mild astringent. Astringents um, reduce bleeding, reduce fluid loss. That astringency helps the ulcer healing. So comfrey is a very well-known vulnerary, but remember that green plants, the green part of plants, um, are rich obviously in chlorophyll and almost all of them are rich in flavonoids. Both groups are anti-inflammatory um, and most flavonoids promote wound healing because of different properties. Not in the way Alan Toen does, but they do promote it. So on the skin, most green 
things, if, if they turned into ointments or used as poultices, can be wound healing. However, there are some which are much better than, than others. So all the herbs that traditionally were called self-heal, uh, and there's lots of them. Um, but the primary ones thought about today, which are not necessarily the best ones, but the most widely used today in North America are going to be calendula, St. John's wort. Um, oh, let's just stick with those two. Um, both very useful anti-inflammatories and wound healers. Um, St. John's wort especially. Um, in Europe we use calendula, actually we use it more internally as um, an anti-inflammatory for the digestive system and a lymphatic agent. It goes really well with cleavers and potentially even with potentially with, with poke, but you've got to get the dose really right there. Um, red clover will be a wound heal healer. Cleavers will be a wound healer. Nettles are a wound healer. Though with nettles you don't put the fresh herb on the wound for obvious reasons. Um, it makes sense in evolutionary terms, in biological, ecological terms, that the green world be very abundant in wound healing green things because the animals wound themselves all the time. Um, they're not just for us. Uh, but there are a couple of things to be concerned about with, um, with vulnerabilities, especially with comfrey. If you have a deep puncture wound, in other words, the wound has gone in beyond the dermis and it's, something's gone in deeply. The problem with comfrey is that it's going to heal up the dermis and the epidermis very rapidly. It really promotes granulation, but much more slowly heals up the deeper tissue wound. So if you close up the top of the wound before the bottom's healed up, you're going to end up with an abscess. Um, and as such, you don't use comfrey on deep wounds. Um, Calendula and St. John's wort are going to be much better there. And you might want to add an antimicrobial herb. And again, there are hundreds of those.